We are live. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us to start your day. Uh, my name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Today is a little bit of all three of those things, which is really exciting. And we are partnering today with Reach the World. So that's an organization that we partnered with for at least eight sessions now from some of the most far-flung reaches across the globe. They are a like-minded organization that works to showcase and celebrate science, exploration, and adventure all around the world through long-form expeditions. So with them, you can track someone as they do their entire journey in remote regions around the world, see pictures, hear stories, and more. It's a really fantastic organization, and we're always thrilled to partner with them. Right now, we've got three classes joining us from across North America. We're expecting three more who hopefully are joining in soon and wiping the sleep out of their eyes. Uh, so I want to give them a chance to do a bit of the introduction. Uh, give them a chance to do a bit of an introduction. We've got Miss McInnes' grade fours in Cumberland Center in Maine. Hi, guys. Let's get you guys demuted. Oh, not letting me demute anyone today. That's okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Awesome, welcome in. We've got Miss uh, Dur Atkinson's grade sevens in Barrie, Ontario. Hi, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a snowy day out there. Yes, it is. Like five, ten centimeters. It's exciting. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and then we've got Miss Daniels' grade nines in Virginia Beach, in Virginia. Hi, guys. Hey, welcome in. Awesome. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Madagascar, which is a really exciting place to be broadcasting live from, by Mae Fami. So she is a scientist working to protect endangered species in the lost forest in Madagascar. It's in south central Madagascar. And what she does, I don't want to spoil it all, but she tracks down a really unique animal to try and get an understanding of all the creatures that are in this remote forest. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mae. Thank you so, so much for joining us live from halfway across the world and take it away should be good to yeah go. hi everyone thank you so much for joining in um so i'm talking to you today from ron mofan national park which is where the center of Bio research station is located so i've gone out to the lost forest already as jesse mentioned and i'm back now sort of gathering my samples and planning my route back to the u.s I had an incredible expedition to the Lost Forest. Um, it took us about four or five days to actually get to my site. Um, and once I got there, I started collecting my samples, um, which are actually terrestrial leeches. So I study um, jungle leeches for my dissertation, for my PhD, and I use them to monitor biodiversity in rainforests. So these leeches feed on the blood of the animals that live in the forests. And I come in and I collect these leeches and I dissect their guts. And then I can determine based on the DNA that I find in their guts, which animals live in the forest that I've collected them from. And so this is a really great way to track uh, endangered, shy, really well camouflaged species that um, things like cameras won't pick up on and researchers often walk right past. So leeches are really providing new and different information in forest inventories um, across the Indo-Pacific, because that's where they're found, these terrestrial leeches. So um, from Australia all the way through to Madagascar, you can find these leeches dotted along um, Southeast Asia. So in Cambodia, Southern China, um, Bangladesh, India, found all throughout this region. Um, and this region harbors a lot of endangered uh, endemic species. So endemism just means that um, these animals are found nowhere else in the world. And Madagascar has some of the highest rates of endemism in the world. So over 90% of all things that live in Madagascar um, are found nowhere else in the world, which makes protecting them pretty important because if we lose them, we'll never get them back. So my work uh, is centered on using leeches, which are overlooked and understudied to actually learn what lives in these special, remote, endangered rainforests in Madagascar. And then what specific, like, is there anything that's been really surprising that you found, May? So when you've been doing these samples or if you've done past work there, is there anything that's jumped out that was a shock to you guys or other researchers for animals in the region? Um, yeah, so my previous work has been here in Ranamafan National Park. I collected 600 leeches out of this park in 2017. And using those leeches, I determined that leeches feed on 
all animals. They don't really specialize on any specific group. So they feed on mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, even some fish that come up onto land during the dry season or during the wet season rather. Um, and so they, they feed on anything that moves, which makes them a really prime tool for these surveys that I'm trying to do because, you know, they feed on anything that walks by. So we can use them to get sort of um, a random sampling of the forest, of the different species that live in the forest. It's got to be really shocking if you're a fish that comes out onto land and suddenly have this worm attack you with very sharp teeth. That's sure. Terrifying. Well, <laughs> interestingly, leeches don't hurt at all. Leech bites, you can hardly feel them at all. Um, really, leeches feel like uh, cold um, water droplets, which is really interesting when you're working in the rainforest because everything feels like a cold water droplet. Um, and so oftentimes <laughs> you'll ask yourself, oh, is it raining or do I have a leech on me? Um, but yeah, that's just the nature of the work. I take it you know this from personal experience. How many times yes. have you had leeches on you? And what is this oh, like? Dozens, dozens of times. And that'll happen if I forget to tuck my shirt into my pants or my socks, um, or my pants into my socks rather. Um, and it's just, you know, it happens. <laughs> and then your clothes get all bloody. And you get, you bleed for a little bit afterwards because leeches release this compound called an anticoagulant. Um, so when they bite you, they release these anticoagulants, which make you bleed for a long time afterwards. And that's for two reasons. That's to help them lap up the blood that they're feeding on. And so that they themselves don't turn into a brick. Um, so once they're filling up on blood and they can fill up to eight times their own body weight in blood. Um, and so you don't want that to get all clotted inside the leech and then it won't be able to move. So the anticoagulants serve a, a few purposes, but they also make you bleed for a long time. Yeah. And so I, I was exploring this with uh, Lynn when she was joining us from Kenya yesterday, but I want to explain to the classes, how do you get to Ranomofana? So you start out uh, and you, you fly, like what are the flights to get to Madagascar to begin with? And then once you're there, how do you get to this park? Yeah. So you arrive in the capital, which is Antananarivo, um, and you have to spend a night in the capital. Um, I wake up the following day, I visit the research facilitation office in town, make sure my permits are all in check, um, and then I arrange for a car to bring me down here to Ranmafan. Um, and that is, on average, a 12-hour car ride down to the park. Um, and more often than not, the car will break down and you'll have to stay at a small village on the way. Um, and then, yeah. So on average, I would say it takes about three days to get to Ranmafan from, from the day you arrive in Tana, if you're not taking any breaks in between. Yeah, and it's not a pleasant road, is it? This is not some, you know, uh, blacktop that's beautiful by any means. Well, Ranmafan has come a long way, actually. The road <laughs> down here is paved, but some of it, <laughs> certainly isn't. Um, and in the rainy season, it can get pretty rough. Yeah. yeah, with the mud. And so when you're in the field, how long are you actually out in Ranamafan? And how long are you in Madagascar when you're doing these expeditions? What's the, the time scale? Right. So I'm only using Ranamafan as a base. So this time around, my field site was the Lost Forest. So getting to Ranamafan took about three days, right? But that was only halfway to my field site. So from Ranamafan, I had to take a five hour car ride to a town called Ihusi, which is west of here. And then I had to spend the night there. And then the next morning we started hiking, but it got too late and we had to spend the night in a local village on the way. And we got up the next morning at 5 a.m. and hiked up the mountain for three hours to get to the site. So it took me a full week to get to my field site from the day I arrived in Madagascar. Yeah. And so what are you eating and drinking out here? Like this is obviously about as remote as you can get on planet Earth. So what is the, the situation? Who's with you? Is it a team of you guys? What's going on? So I'm working um, with Dr. Patricia Wright and Dr. Mark Siddall. Um, uh, Dr. Wright is a world-renowned conservationist, primatologist. She's the founder of Ranamafan National Park. She's an incredible woman. Um, no project is too ambitious for Pat. Um, and Dr. Mark Siddall is my PhD advisor. He's the curator of parasitology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And uh, he flew in also to join me on my expedition. And so I guess day to day, we are camped out 
with um, a team of rangers and guides and cooks and gendarmes. And gendarmes are sort of armed, armed officials that accompany us on our expedition because the Lost Forest isn't a, a protected site. It's not a national park. Um, and so we need sort of reinforcement while we're out there. So we picked up four local gendarmes, as they're called, um, to accompany us. We had our team of rangers and guides and um, uh, Center of Bio technicians who are specialists in uh, birds and amphibians and lemurs. And they come out with us too to help us inventory all the animals in the forest. Um, and so we get to camp with all these people. Um, and obviously we have a ton of gear and this gear, luckily we don't have to carry up ourselves. We hire local people from the villages to carry our things up the mountain. Um, and we pay them very well for this service and we're extremely grateful for it. Um, but uh, we have our stuff carried up the mountain and we set up camp at our site. And then the cooks get to work preparing rice, which we have with every meal. <laughs> Um, and usually we have some sort of um, vegetable or meat garnish on the side, but most of the time we're eating rice, rice with a little bit of something else. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I could ask a million questions, but you know what, between our classes that are live with us, and we've got a ton on YouTube, we've got 10 classes, five of which have already highlighted where they're from. Uh, I want to start taking questions from classes, May, so if that works with you, let's dive sure. right in. Sure. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So before we dive in, I just want to say I was Thompson's class just joined us grade sixes from Peterborough, Ontario. So welcome into the live session. Uh, and then we've got classes from all over Ontario, Illinois, uh, Virginia, Michigan, and St. John's in Newfoundland. So what a fantastic group online. If you guys want to share questions, type them in on YouTube. I'll share as many as I can. So please get to that as soon as you can about Madagascar, May's work, and, and more. So yes, let's dive in. Uh, Miss McKinnis's class, I'm going to come to you guys first. And if you guys have a question to kick us off. Go for it. Let's come on. Somebody? Oh, quick, quick. No, no worries. <laughs> Don't need to be quick. Medium speed. <laughs> um, do you have pictures to show us? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I have pictures <laughs> on my phone that are not ready to be shared. Um, I have so many pictures, <laughs> so many pictures, um, but I, I haven't had the chance to upload them to my computer. Um, I've been out in the field every day here, so it's it's been hard to stay on top of that. But I promise you, by the end of the week, you'll have pictures that you can go in and look at. Yeah, well, and so I wanted to note too for our classes that at the end of this, I'm going to pass along the Reach the World link so you can follow along with May's expedition and learn a little bit more about it. And when those pictures are up, I will send them to all our classes that are here today so you can check out and then keep up with the learning, which is great. But great question to start us off. Uh, all right, uh, Miss uh, Thompson's class, if you guys want to come in and do a question about Madagascar, about May's work, go for it. Um, how many endangered animals are there in Madagascar? Yeah. Great question. Um, so almost all, almost all the animals in Madagascar are endangered or threatened. Um, and that's because they're found nowhere else. So when you have animals that live in very small ranges, very restricted ranges, um, they come under high threat because there's so few of them to begin with. Um, and so for example, uh, you might know that Madagascar is home to lemurs. Um, which are found nowhere else in the world. And most of those are highly threatened with extinction. Um, over 90% of all the frogs in Madagascar are, th are threatened with extinction. Um, about 90% of the birds. So almost everything here is extremely threatened. And that's because most of the forest that covered this island has been logged. It's no longer here. And it provided habitat for all these um, incredibly special animals. So with the forest lost, um, we're, we're at risk of losing a lot of Madagascar's wildlife and we won't be able to get it back yeah. once it's gone. But we're not there yet. <laughs> we are not there yet. There's still some to protect, which is very important. Yes. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Atkinson's class, if you guys have one, come on up. <laughs> 
<laughs> Take your time. What was the most interesting endangered species you found so far? Ooh. Wow. Okay. So I have to say, um, one of the most exciting things I saw was a giant land snail in the lost forest. Um, because we think it's a new species to science. Um, so it's this massive snail. If you make a fist with your hand, that's about the size of it. Um, and it's this jet black snail shell with a gorgeous speckled rim that's black and white and a just a huge mollusk coming out with these big feelers and it's it's a big animal it's it's very impressive um and it's found nowhere else it's only exists in this lost forest it seems and um we're going to do some genetic analysis on it once we're back in the u.s and um name it and we have a new species very cool and then do you get to name the new species personally or was it part of your uh, how does that work <laughs> yeah so Typically, yes, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to auction off the right to name it um, to help fund the research station that I love to stay at, um, Central Bell Bio. And so I've done that already with a species of leech that I discovered in 2017. Um, I auctioned off the right to name it for $3,000. Very cool. <laughs> for Central Bell Bio. And that goes Sorry. a lot with Madagascar, $3,000. It does, it does. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, that's a great answer. I've never had that one before. Um, <laughs> yeah. Miss uh, Miss Daniels' class, if you guys want to come up with a question, we had another class join us live too, so we'll come to you guys in just a minute. Yeah, come on up, guys. Okay. So, uh, what are some other parasites we see, and can leeches also be affected by parasites? Can I didn't hear the second half of yeah. that question, Kim? I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Can leeches, can leeches also be infected by parasites? Ah, can leeches also be infected with oh. parasites? Yeah. Yeah, and what what were what was some what was the most interesting? What are some other? Yeah, what are some yeah. other parasites you've seen, and can leeches be infected by parasites as well? Yeah. So funny enough, everything can have a parasite, even parasites. Any parasite that you think of can also be parasitized, and so the study of parasites can get very complicated because you quickly learn that the parasites that you're studying have parasites themselves, and so leeches. Are considered ectoparasites. Um, they are parasites that latch onto the outer skin of an animal, um, but in their blood, they harbor uh, sort of these parasites that are related to malaria, but they're not actually malaria that'll make you sick. Um, they're called trypanosomes, um, and so leeches actually carry trypanosomes, um, and you'll find that's the case with many other parasites. Um, in the forest, I've seen really interesting fungi that parasitizes insects. Um, and so it'll sort of infect the body, the individual, and it'll sprout spores out of the moth or the beetle or whatever it's infecting. And so it'll look like this little alien with fungus growing out of it. It's very creepy, um, but it's awesome. Um, yeah, so I've, I've seen things like that. Yeah. Uh, just a quick follow up on that, because you mentioned a lot of stories that are around invertebrates and so many people when they go to Madagascar or anywhere are interested in the big charismatic animals, lemurs, big snakes. Yeah. What got you interested in all the little <laughs> things in the undergrowth? Yeah, I mean, I've always sort of been drawn to it. Um, as a little girl, I was flipping over rocks in my yard and playing with worms. And then in undergrad, I joined an earthworm research lab. And so the transition to leeches wasn't a big jump for me because leeches are worms. Um, but I, I just, I really like the understudied, overlooked little things that people don't normally pay attention to. Um, and in general, most of the diversity on earth um, is attributed to the invertebrates. So that there are more species of beetle living on the planet than there are species of anything else ever, um, which is kind of crazy to think about. So they make up most of life and I find them fascinating. Very cool. I love the, like, uh, as a comparison, all the mammals, all the bats, primates, rodents, everything, about 6,000 species of those, and there's over a quarter million beetles. So, and that's minimum, like way probably more yeah, than that. Yeah, yeah, low balling it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. Before we go to our fifth live class, I just want to note, again, some great questions coming in from YouTube. I'll start taking those in a second. For the teachers that haven't, please do share them. I'd love to take as many as we can. Uh, but yeah, let's dive in with Miss uh, Ocolta's class, who are joining us from Brooklyn Park in Minnesota. Hi guys, let's see if you guys have uh, any questions for 
May. I know you came in a little halfway through, but. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, we did have a, a couple questions for uh, my, let's see. Um, how many species have you already discovered? Um, how many species did I discover? So that's an interesting question. Um, I've discovered a new species of leech, um, but I've also found that leeches feed <coughs> on up to 42 different species of different mammals, frogs, birds, reptiles. Um, and those are species that are known to science. But what I found through my research is that leeches will feed on up to 42 different species. Um, uh, so I, I've discovered one species new to science, but I've found through my research that leeches feed on a wide variety of other animals. Yeah, I also love that that class had like a microphone to ask questions. I know. <laughs> I really need one of those. Um, yeah. And I want to mention too, sorry, but you highlighted uh, insects and undergrowth so well. Uh, Life in the Undergrowth, BBC series. It's a documentary and it's a book. It's really fantastic. If you want to get like some of the coolest facts and coolest stories and, and just get inspired by it, that's a great resource. Mm -hmm. Thank you for nodding your head, May. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I want to take some questions from classes on YouTube. So Miss Tromley's class uh, is joining us from Tapas Casing in Ontario, grade one and twos, and they wanted to ask, what's the biggest leech you found? <laughs> um, okay, the biggest leech I found uh, is one that had fed to completion. It was fully eight times the size it originally had been. Um, and so if you want to sort of look at that on your own hand, I would say it was about the length of your pinky finger um and about half the width yeah very cool awesome yeah um all right i want to take one from mr kozachinsky's class so she is joining us from uh second graders in canton michigan and they wanted to ask uh to, to do a bunch of questions actually okay how many different types of leeches are in the area that you're studying so leeches aren't just there's not just one leech there's lots what how many are out there yeah, so um, when I did my research in Ronda Mofan in 2017, I found that there were three species of leeches living in the forest. Um, out of the leeches that I collected um, in the lost forest, I've identified nine different um, morphotypes, which means that I've just identified nine different um, leeches that I can identify just by looking at them. But that's not to say that they're genetically all different species because what we find with leeches is that two leeches can look really different from each other, but actually be the same species. So I'm going to take a guess and say it's about four species that I, I got out of the lost forest. Um, and I, I forgot to mention, I collected 1,451 leeches out of the lost forest. So it was Whoa. a great, great expedition. Yeah. You crushed your 600 record from last time. That's I awesome. did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, Ms. Jewess's class in the Keene, Ontario, wanted to ask, where do you find the leeches? So you, you found over 1,400 leeches. Where are you picking them up from? Like, what's going on? Are they coming to you? What's happening? <laughs> yeah. So collecting leeches is no big deal. Um, all you have to do is walk through the forest and just pay attention to your clothing and um, you'll you'll find that you're attracting leeches left and right so uh, uh what i do when i collect leeches is i make sure that you know my shirt's tucked in um my pants are tucked into my boots and i take a slow stroll through the forest um and i just pay attention to the undergrowth i pay attention i look at my boots a lot of times the leeches will crawl up my boots um or i'll brush against a tree or a bush and they'll um sort of come off on my sleeves of my raincoat and i, I just pick them off um, and so long as they haven't fed on any human blood, then I'm interested in them. But once they've broken skin, then they're contaminated with human DNA and that's no longer an interesting leech. Huh, very interesting. How neat is that? Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, let's dive back in with some live classes before we go back to YouTube. So Ms. McKinnis' class, if you guys want to come back up again, go for it. Let's just get you up. Go. How do you get leeches off? <laughs> the question we knew was coming. <laughs> Uh, okay, so me personally, I'm usually too busy um, to bother trying to get a leech off myself. So I usually just let them feed and they'll fall off on their own. Um, I've usually got my hands full with other leeches that I'm trying to get into tiny plastic bags, um, which is very difficult because <laughs> they move around a lot. But if it's really bothering you that a leech is feeding on you, you can just like, you take a fingernail and just kind of scrape 
scrape along where the leech has latched and it'll come right off. And like what a lot of people hear when they hear about leeches, certainly I did growing up, was either fire or salt. So is there anything to this? Do you, you don't need to do that? There's no need. There's no need. Just scrape them off. You'll be fine. No, don't burn the poor leeches. That's sort of Don't thing. burn it. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, all right, Miss Thompson's class, if you guys have a second question, come on up. Coming up right now. Yeah, perfect. Does salt affect leeches in any negative ways? Yeah. Yes, so it does. Um, leeches are soft-bodied invertebrates, which means they don't have um, a hard outer shell like beetles and other insects. Um, and so they need moisture to stay healthy and to stay alive. And once you sprinkle some salt on a leech, um, that actually causes the leech to lose all the water in its body and it'll shrivel up and die. So salt will kill the leech, yep. So we're gonna, so for the rest of the class and for all time to live on YouTube, salt and fire, no need, just use your- No fingers. need, yeah. Right. Um, Leeches are actually really important because they are, they serve as indicators of forest quality. So in forests that have a healthy canopy, um, you'll find that the understory is nice and moist and shady. Um, and leeches love that. But in areas where leech, where forests have been logged, where trees have been removed, um, you'll find that more light is coming down to the understory and drying out the lower level of the forest. Um, and that makes it um, inhospitable for leeches. And so where you find leeches, um, you know that you're in a, in a healthy forest because the canopy is intact. Yeah, I'm really happy we brought that up. And this is something that we covered with vultures and other species that a lot of people are innately a little fearful of or they don't understand uh, is that a lot of these things are really important for conservation, for the health of the ecosystem and just in general and, and deserve the right to, to exist. So I'm, I'm glad that I got brought up. Thanks, May. Yes. All right, uh, Mr. Atkinson's class, if you guys have another question, come on up. Hey, guys, um, you shouldn't be chatting. That's right. <laughs> What made you think of using leeches for tracking devices? And are there any other methods to track down or find other species? Cool question. That is a great question. So leeches are sort of notorious for their blood feeding behavior. Um, and researchers back in 2012 decided to test if in the lab you could detect the blood of the animal that the leech had fed on. So they fed a leech in a lab some goat blood, and then they dissected that leech and found that you can determine that the leech had fed on a goat. So this was all done in a lab in 2012. And then into 2015 and 2016, people started sampling land leeches um, in Australia and in um, Southeast Asia. But when I stepped into my uh, PhD research, no one had really focused on determining the feeding behavior of the leeches in Madagascar. Um, and I had known from previous, from previous work that I wanted to go back to Madagascar to do my, my research. And um, that's how that sort of fell into place. But leeches certainly aren't the only ones, um, aren't the only invertebrates that we can use to track other animals. Researchers have tried to use ticks, which are also blood feeding um, and certain blood feeding flies. But I will say that leeches, I think, are the best tool out there in terms of invertebrate ingested DNA tracking um, because they don't have wings. So they're not going to be flying around um, and sort of skewing your data because the leeches that you collect are going to reflect the diversity um, from where you collected them. Um, so you don't risk getting sort of confusing answers about a fly that had fed in one spot and then flew over to wherever you collected it from. Um, but okay, so those are the invertebrates. But of course, traditionally speaking, researchers have used cameras that they strap to trees um, to take stock of the animals that live in the forest. Yeah. So interesting too that you mentioned that 2012 is when this research sort of took off. And this is a, a great lesson for classrooms that science is always changing. Like there's new techniques and, and strategies that are, are really changing how we understand conservation uh, happening all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Also, you, you provided us with one of the great taglines for a presentation ever. You know, the best creature for invertebrate, you know, blood DNA. <laughs> yes. That. Uh, that was <laughs> All right. Um, 
I want to pass along a, a question from the Reach the World staff, actually, and this is for our classes. So you mentioned auctioning off the name uh, of getting to name a species. Is this something that anyone can participate in? Could classrooms participate in something like this? How does this work? Yeah, so I auctioned off the leech, uh, the naming of the leech at um, a fundraiser at the Explorers Club in New York City last winter. Um, and it was a fundraiser specifically for Central Valbaya Research Station. Um, but I know that they're trying to hold these events again more regularly. Um, but I, I don't know if there's uh, sort of a way for classrooms to participate in this process. No worries. I'm just always curious to that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, we've got Miss Painter's class, World Geography class, grade eights in Salem, Virginia. Uh, it's nice to have them back, by the way. I haven't seen Miss Painter in a while. Uh, and they wanted to ask, why do you like doing this job so much? It's been pretty obvious that you do love this job. What's the reason? Oh, wow. Well, I get to spend weeks at a time hanging out in Madagascar, living in the rainforest, um, seeing incredible things, meeting amazing people. Um, my hair is wet. I just came out of the river in Ranamafan National Park after a swim. Um, it's just, it's, I, I went into grad school to have this experience. So, I mean, I had the opportunity to study abroad when I was in college and I came to Madagascar for six weeks and I learned more than I had um, in that short time than I did in some of my semesters in college. And I was just hooked on, you know, the wildlife and the people and also um, the urgent need for conservation out here. And I, I knew that I was going to be determined to get back out here to, to help protect the remaining wildlife. Yeah, what a beautiful answer. And, and something that uh, harkens back, Lynn yesterday had mentioned the fact, and this is for grade nine students and for, for younger kids that are seeking to maybe become scientists as they get older, uh, seek out opportunities to do stuff in the field. Seek out opportunities yes. to research projects. Don't just stay in classes. Um, you will almost always learn more from actually getting out and interacting with people in an in a impactful way. So great. absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Great message. Um, all right, Miss Stead's class joining us at grade six is in St. John's, Newfoundland, one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, they wanted to ask, what's the top predator in the Madagascar jungle? And then similarly, what's at the bottom of the food chain there? Okay, um, so great question. The top predator is uh, the fusa um, and the big fusa. So there's a big fusa and a little fusa. Um, the big fusa is the top predator. Um, the little fusa is sort of a little tiny mongoose ferret. Um, but uh, big fusa hunts lemurs out of trees um, and it looks a little bit like a cat, but it's definitely not. Um, it's, it belongs to its own taxonomic group. It's its own family. Um, and uh, the closest relative of the fusa is the mongoose, but but it's definitely its own its own uh, species. Uh, I'll share a picture of the fusa with classes afterwards. They're really unique. Yeah. Nothing quite yeah. like them. I think no. it's a giant scary tree weasel. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> lemurs. Lemurs uh, take note. All right. Yes. Uh, let's take two more from our live class. So, Miss Daniel's group. If you guys have another question, come on up. Come on up. Are there any behavioral differences in the seasons compared to with leeches, like the dry season and the wet season? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so leeches prefer cool, moist environments, um, and that's when they're going to be most active. So um, I guess, so obviously it, it's optimal to come collect leeches during the wet season when they're going to be more active in that <coughs> moist environment. Um, uh, and then in the dry season, it sort of gets harder to find them because they become less active. Um, they don't move around as much. But you also see this change in behavior just um, between forests of different quality. So in a primary forest, you'll find easily maybe two or three times more leeches than you would in a disturbed or secondary recovering forest where there's a lot more heat reaching the understory. So it doesn't always rely on season necessarily but it's more about sort of the microclimate in the forest itself. Yeah, great question. Um, all right, Ms. Wakulta's class, you guys should be done your announcements now, so I'll come back to you guys for a second question. Go for it. Oh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, I'll ask it. Uh, since, um, but we did have a question about um, leeches, like can you eat leeches? 
Um, or like we noticed that you wrote about carnivorous leeches. Would those be tastier? Uh, if you were to eat them, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So my advisor, Mark Siddall, uh, has eaten a leech on a dare before. Um, uh, they are not not widely consumed. Um, other other invertebrates are, like crickets and mealworms, um, are being used as sources of protein, but um, not so much leeches. Um, the carnivorous leeches, they do feed on other, other worms and small invertebrates, but I don't think that they taste any different or any better necessarily. <laughs> So if the class ever gets out to Madagascar and wants to try one, we'll do a follow-up session and find out all about it. We're excited. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, guys, let's dive through another round of questions. Uh, we're doing great for time. So let's start again with Ms. McInnes' class. If you guys want a third one, come on up. Let's see. Do, yeah. do leeches eat leeches? Do leeches eat leeches? Is that the question? Yeah, are they yeah. Do they, yeah, do they get each other? Oh, okay. Um, certain leeches do in South America, but not the ones that I'm dealing with here in Madagascar. Yeah, I bet, again, I bet the leech never saw that coming. You're just a leech, you're going around <laughs> the floor, and then like your, your cousin comes over and starts fighting you. Uh, yeah. Great question, guys. Uh, all right, I miss Thompson's class. You guys have another one. Come on up. How many species are in Madagascar? Total of leeches or of everything? Of everything. Everything. Oh boy, that's a what? lot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's a high percentage of those species that are found nowhere else. Um, and a lot of these species that are found here are very diverse. Um, and so just to give you some estimates, I think there's about 115 species of lemur alone. Um, there are uh, maybe around 80 species of birds. Um, and then there's hundreds of species of frogs, uh, 100 species of reptiles. Um, invertebrates are uncountable. R really just no one knows how many there are. Um, there, and people are still discovering new species here in Madagascar, just to give you an idea of how diverse it is. Um, so, those are just some estimates and they're not the final count by any means. Yeah, excellent. I'm really glad we got that question. Actually, yeah. you said in our email setting this talk up that you had some crazy stories. So I, before we dive in with more questions, what is a crazy story from the field, something <laughs> that people would never otherwise experience were they not in Madagascar? <laughs> yeah, sure. So my advisor, um, Dr. Siddall, decided to bring a UV light to the field. Um, so it's, it's a little black light, little flashlight that, that shines a black light. And so at night, we would go out looking for scorpions at our campsite. <laughs> and the scorpions, for whatever reason, it's not really known why they do this, but they fluoresce. They light up like stars once you shine a UV light onto them. Um, and so we were horrified to learn that our campsite was infested with scorpions. Um, and every night, Mark would go out collecting you know, a dozen or so scorpions. Um, and funny enough, he would find them mostly concentrated out by the latrine, which is where we go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, awesome. So whenever we had to go to the bathroom, he would offer to walk us with his little UV light and clear the way of scorpions um, and then walk back. <laughs> this is not a problem that most of our students will have on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, so thank you. Right. For that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to note too, it's not just scorpions in Madagascar, scorpions everywhere fluorescent. Everywhere. Light. And so yes. if, you, if you're ever in a desert in the States or if you're in a place uh, that has them and you have a black light, you'll find out again that there are way more scorpions than you ever thought yes. there were. Very cool. All right. Yes. Oh, so yeah. another thing that we spotted with the UV light was a scorpion, but um, upon taking a closer look, we realized it was actually a scorpion that was in the jaws of a cricket which was wild because the cricket was that big and the cricket had the scorpion, not the other way around. And we watched the cricket walk off with the scorpion in its jaws. And that just was unbelievable. Glorious. Um, again, yeah. very unexpected. The scorpion never saw that coming. <laughs> 
Cool. Right. Uh, <laughs> let's head to uh, Mr. Atkinson's class and try and ask a question that will solicit a better answer than crickets. That <laughs> no pressure yes. at all. Yes. Yeah, you're good. Okay. How many un undiscovered species could be discovered by dissecting leeches and just exploring them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit, truly. Um, <laughs> we really don't understand exactly how many species there are in Madagascar. Um, we're always finding new species. Um, in fact, not only did we find a, a new species of snail, but um, we have potentially a new species of chameleon, um, one of the teeny tiny leaf litter chameleons that are really hard to spot. Um, and, uh, and so, I mean, if the leeches can pick up on them, great. If we find them ourselves, wonderful. I mean, but there's, there's really no limit to the number of species we can discover, I think, yeah. in Madagascar. I love that we're, again, we're using these new technologies and sciences to discover new species. One of the newest things that's been really neat, uh, both in soil and in water samples, is you can just take a sample of water or soil and sift it for DNA. And almost every time they do that, they find new bacterial, viral species that they had no idea existed. So it's a, it's a, yes, it's a really it's exciting amazing. time to be a biologist, right? It's, it's fantastic. It is, it is. Uh, you mentioned chameleons, and I want to harp on that for a second to highlight uh, a little bit about chameleons in Madagascar generally. And then you mentioned scorpions with black light. Chameleons look a little different at night, too, or they certainly have a way of finding them. Is there, can you speak a little to that? Yeah. Um, so typically when we go out looking for chameleons at night, um, what you do is you look at the tips of the leaves in the forest. Um, and the chameleons you'll find are sort of latched on to the very edge of the leaf. Um, and that's so that uh, when a predator is making its way up the tree, um, the chameleon will sort of sense it from afar and it'll have the chance to drop off of the tree and make an escape. So um, chameleons are um, very strategically placed uh, at the tips of leaves in the evening so that they can escape predation. Yeah. And Madagascar is host to more of them than anywhere else, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Uh Oh, yes, yes, there are tons and tons of species of chameleons. Um, the smallest species in the world is found in Madagascar. Yeah, and he's about the size of your fingernail. He can fit sort of just around and curl himself around pygmy chameleon. That yes. Very cool. All yes. right, I'm going to take three more questions. So Ms. Wakulta's class first, then I'll come to Ms. Daniel and take one from a group online. So Ms. Wakulta's class, if you guys have a third question, go for it. Okay, um, I know we didn't really come up with a question here, okay. but I know we've had a question like kind of about like style in Madagascar and like just, you know, you, you went out into the field, um, how long did it take you, like how long did you walk this time um, to get to your destination? Yeah. Did you guys yeah. a little after that? So May, if you wouldn't mind repeating a little bit about what- uh, Of course. There. Yeah. Yeah, let me elaborate about the hike. So I mentioned that we had to do a three hour hike up a mountain. <clears throat> and um, so what you need to picture right now is this prairie that's been burned down. Um, and there, there's just, as far as you can see, there's burned grass. Um, and so we're hiking up these hills, one hill after the other, and all you can see is burnt ground. Um, and it feels like there's no way we're ever going to come across a forest. And we're just hiking hill after hill, always on an incline. Um, and for three hours, you're hiking this landscape. Um, and suddenly you hear the forest before you see it. So just before you get over the last hill, you're still surrounded by this burnt ground, but suddenly Suddenly you hear birds, you hear birds over the hill and they get louder and louder and they're parrots that are calling to each other from one fragment to the next. And then you see them and you come over the hill and there's this immense forest that's stretched out into the gullies and it's, it's growing because it's been protected from the fires that come through the region by cliffs. Um, and so it's sort of miraculous that this site even exists still. And so the creatures that live here um, are very unique. They're found from all throughout Madagascar, which makes this site extremely interesting. 
Um, and, and it makes it really important to protect. It's one of the last remaining green spaces in this region. Um, and that's because the people who live out in this region are, are burning the landscape to help uh, support their livestock, um, or, or so they believe. Um, it's, it's a complicated a relationship that conservationists have with the local people out here because um, they believe that the cows like to feed on the little tiny green shoots that start to grow um, after you burn a forest. Um, but the reality of the situation is we saw maybe seven cows in two weeks. Um, and so they're, they're just not feeding on, on the shoots that people claim that they do and uh, what you're getting is just constant burning and on any given day at our campsite you could look out over the horizon and see plumes of smoke and in fact one day one morning we were heading into the forest and we came across this huge down tree and it looked like a burning cigarette and it had been burning for days and it left in its trail this ash and we came across it as it was still smoking and we sent back to camp for water and we put out the rest of the fire that was burning in the core of this tree. And so it's, it's real. I mean, the deforestation is happening on a daily basis um, and the animals are threatened and the forest is shrinking. And so it's, it's really important that we get expeditions like this out um, to take surveillance of the species that live in this forest before they don't anymore. But like I said, we're not there yet and we're going to work to make sure that that doesn't happen. But um, yeah, I mean, getting there was a real shock just seeing that landscape burned over and over and over again. Yeah, uh, it's one of the most degraded landscapes in the world as you've highlighted and it's a, a real conservation challenge because of the relationship between the community and local people. So I'm really, really glad we brought that up. Uh, although mm -hmm. I have hope the beginning of your talk when you're talking about coming to the forest should be in like a Madagascar tourism ad. So if it's <laughs> advocating for it, I think we have, we have hope for these places. Uh, all right, uh, let's finish off with two more questions, guys, from Miss Daniels' class. If you guys want to come up for our, our last one from a live class, go for it. So we're, that was kind of a nice segue for us. Yeah. Um, when you were just talking about deforestation, but Kim has a question about that. I'll let her. Awesome. Um, so like, based off of uh, when you were there in 2017, is there a big noticeable difference in the amount of forest there is now? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, well, so yes, yes. The short answer is yes. Um, just driving down from Tana to Ranamukwan, <clears throat> you look out and you can just see where there are rainforest trees that used to stand. Um, and they're sort of standing out in the fields alone in the midst of these big rice paddies that now exist instead of the forest. Um, and so you can see um, sort of how recently the landscape has been burned and how recently it's been degraded every time you come. Um, Ranamafan is different because it's a national park, it's protected, it has park boundaries, um, but even the Lost Forest, um, the, the team that was out there last time in 2016 noticed a difference in the forest edge um, and noticed that the fires are creeping into the forest more and more. Uh, if you guys use Google Earth uh, and maybe even the pro version, I don't know what it is, but you can see uh, Madagascar over the last 25 years radically decline in forest cover. It's, it's basically the national parks now. Um, yeah. Have real protection. Uh, and outside of that, the forest has been degraded or, or lost entirely. It's a really uh, unfortunate situation, but it's such a unique and amazing place that, it, again, it's really, really worth protecting. And hopefully, you guys get a chance to, to see it someday, uh, whether through May's expedition or, or in person. Um, before we wrap up, I, I wanted to pass along one great question to Mr. K's class on YouTube, which is after completing this research, where are you going next in the world for your next project? Are you so enamored with Madagascar you have to stay? Is there other places you're keen to go? What's going on? Uh, Madagascar will always have my heart, um, but I am eager to explore um, parts of Africa like Rwanda um, and Uganda. But um, I, I know that I'll be back to Madagascar <clears throat> For many many years. Yeah. Um, uh, I think after I finish my PhD 
I would like to do some research on um, biodiversity in um, areas that have undergone human conflict. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd be eager to explore certain parts of Africa for that research. Outstanding. And you know, <laughs> uh, before we wrap up, I just, we've already mentioned your Reach the World site, which is fantastic, charts your expedition. For classes that want to learn more about you or about Madagascar in general, where would you recommend that they go? Oh, good question. Um, so I'm constructing a website about myself currently um, that will be up and running shortly, um, and I can send that link along. But I would say um, you should start by watching Dr. Pat Wright's movie on Madagascar. <coughs> it's called Madagascar Island of Lemurs. It's an IMAX film <clears throat> narrated by Morgan Freeman. Excuse me. <coughs> And you can find it online. Um, oh, I need water, it's okay. <coughs> so start there. <laughs> um, and then read her book. I have to say um, she is an inspiration. Um, read her book, High Moon Over the Amazon and read her book For the Love of Lemurs. <laughs> She's just been an incredible role model. Yeah. And she's worked in Madagascar for 30 years. I need a drink of water. <laughs> Can I take a drink of water? You know, uh, again, I'm going to pass along Pat Wright's information and some of those books and resources to all the classes when we're done. I also okay. really encourage, I mentioned Life in the Undergrowth earlier to you guys. There's also a BBC Madagascar series, which is really short. It's just three episodes. So really, really neat. Get a drink of water. Right? <laughs> take your time. <laughs> um, so lots of opportunities to learn more. It's a really fantastic and unique place. And I'm excited to, to help share a little bit more to uh, help you guys follow up. So with that said, uh, you know, at the end of every session, May, if you can still hear me, great. If you can't, you'll be back in a second. Um, but this has been fantastic, guys. Thanks to our live classes. Thanks to all our groups joining on YouTube. And so what we do at the end of every session, uh, in a minute when, when May is back and we're all good, I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. So I'll, I'll wait for you back. Um, again, for classes that are interested in checking out more live expeditions, do check out Lynn's from Kenya yesterday. This is really great. But May's back now. And so as I said, uh, Boys and girls, what I'm going to do, I'm going to demute everyone's microphones. And so if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to May for joining us from halfway across the world today. You are all now demuted. Go for it. Awesome. That was fantastically enthusiastic. May, thank you so, so much for joining us. What an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. I so enjoyed doing this. And uh, yeah, I hope I hope you all make it out here someday. <laughs> yeah, and we look forward to following up soon. We'd love to do another when you're back with pictures and videos and stories. And we'll share yes. as much as we can in the meantime, okay? Awesome.